Are you tired of juggling contacts, manually following up, and deals falling through the cracks? We can fix it so you never lose another lead, enabling 24-7 sales and support via an AI that learns your business. Ready to close more deals with less hassle? Get a free trial of our marketing automation at thebuzzcrm.com. Thanks for joining me for another Blunt Business on CannabisRadio.com. Really appreciate all of you joining us. If you haven't done so, if you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so. Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And please rate and review the show. And, of course, you can find all of our programming, CannabisRadio.com. Before we get started on my next guest, let's go ahead and talk to you about our sponsors here at The Buzz CRM. And it's comprehensive marketing suite, over 500 marketing tools in one platform, and businesses can have everything they need to manage, automate, and optimize their marketing efforts efficiently. AI-powered marketing automation, omni-channel communication, conversational AI, smart workflows and customization, and best intellectual reporting, all in one, the Buzz CRM. You can get your free trial right now, thebuzzcrm.com, thebuzzcrm.com. And let's go to my next guest, which, before we get into anything, I'm always fascinated by who we bring into the industry and who comes in from the into the cannabis industry and the backgrounds. Now, I'm not, as you know, on grassroots marketing, small business to matter. I'm not the person that asks, well, tell us about your background. Even when I tell other podcasters that I produce for, don't tell us about your background. I try to cut out those questions because I'm like, let's just get to the meat of the matter. But my guest right now has quite an extensive background when it comes to your background. So first of all, I worked at NBC Universal Television Distribution back at the start of the millennium and was director of video music product development went on to see the launch of the studios tv to dvd business nbc sports group joined after that for a while and then leading marketing communications for the action sports division of the media giant nbc universal and then working also with fender musical guitars and being a vp of digital brand marketing media communications that's a lot right there and then also coming into the cannabis industry and working with the folks at MedMen, you know, legendary, one of those first things also as a original chief marketing officer. And it's amazing. And right now, my guest is currently holding the role as senior vice president of marketing at TerraSend and as BJ Coretta. Thanks for being on with us. Thanks for having me. Um, really I know I cut out all the uh, the part of like the, the background, but it's like, there's a lot there. I just wanted to get into just compact that right to just say because there's a lot that want to go ahead and apply what you've learned from your experience to bring into the space here and working and running teams like again not just MedMen but also Columbia Care and going through there and just learning so much from that and, and just taking in what you have of your marketing expertise to bring it into the space here so one of the things I want to take an area is you know the fact that you manage marketing for those kind of brands Columbia Care now is a cannabis and You've ensured consistent brand messaging, consumer engagement across different states. And that's one of the areas I want to talk about, you know, that how you ensure that brand messaging. Because that's what I've always said. There's all these things about trying to create a national brand or trying to create a consistent brand across. And how they're able to do that versus how to go ahead and market it to states. Go ahead and talk to me about that part of creating that brand consistency. Yeah. The, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, mm. This is great when you hear one's individual background verbally it's very interesting and different than reading it what a resume come on <laughs> i appreciate that you know from from my perspective and our perspective you mentioned national brands versus brands state brands etc you know i'm probably in a little bit of the minority around this but i don't really believe there are national cannabis brands for the most part outside of probably cookies uh, who is our partner in multiple states uh, and a lot of that has to do with just the lifestyle um, accessories, merchandising, things that they've, they've been doing, which they're great at. Our focus is state by state. I mean, our you know we, we sell our products in our markets, right? And we focus on our brands in that state or that consumer. Um, I don't think the cannabis industry is at the maturation point where, you know, it's ready for a national brand or a national brand campaign, nor are the advertising opportunities available for something like that. And then thirdly, 
that costs a lot of money to do something like that. And we're just, we're in an industry where our focus is on first and foremost, making amazing products. I mean, if we don't have amazing products, then we don't have brands. Uh, and then really partnering with one, our own stores, but also our third party dispensary partners on activating those brands in their, in their dispensaries. And I'm going to bring that up in a minute, but I want to just, before we go move on to that, I just want to get the idea of, as you said, cookies was a great example. And part of their national branding strategy is because they have merchandise. And that's what's been kind of been able to bridge the gap for all markets that might not even have cookies available in their area to go ahead and connect. Cause you see that, that brand, that, that product line, see the shirts. I see it all over the place. And it's also being distributed to different stores. Is that one of the things that you feel like is the reason why you can't make the investment in national branding because you need to be able to have, have a way to attach customers to the product or something that, uh, to the brand in all 50 states? You do. And uh, the ways you do that are through clothing lines, are through content distribution, are through seven, eight figure ad spends on television and streaming services. And that's just not in the cards right now uh, for us on where we are. So that that just isn't our focus. I think Cookies has done an amazing job with it over time and visually is unbelievably appealing. You know, I was just in a store out here. I live in LA. Mm-hmm. And I was just staring at the packaging on the shelf that they do and it's great, right? Yeah. Um, and they pull that all the way through to hoodies and, you know, they have that consumer focus at this point in time. It's amazing where, I mean, I've seen other companies that are doing the same thing. I know Planet 13 is trying to make that approach as well. With a, like, this mixed martial arts, they, they combat fighting gear. And there's other companies, obviously, that have their own merch that hopefully will also attract customers or at least will attract them to the product, which, you know, there's part of it, I guess. You know, it's amazing where I feel like there is a bit of a niche in this industry because of the fact that there are a lot of companies that want to go ahead and create merchandise to help promote their product or find a way to go ahead and just at least make another revenue stream i mean when you look at that you know what is it that you feel like warrants the need to go ahead and say okay you know what our product you know when you have a particular brand how do you determine when you think that that extra revenue model is is something that you could possibly go ahead and pursue uh you know i think that it's interesting because just with the action sports background the one thing i learned with those brands is don't try to be cool Uh because if you try to be cool you're going to lose at the end of the day, uh, you have to just be cool. And the brand's ethos and how it was born and developed and grown and the people wearing it need to represent what it stands for. And you just can't manufacture that out of out of nowhere, right? I mean, you right. we can make things and put them on a shelf and sell them. It doesn't mean that they're cool. And I think that a lot of brands are like, oh, I'm going to start a merch line or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And they just try too hard. And it ends up, you know, coming back and biting them in the, you know what? So that's not our focus. Our focus is, is first and foremost starts with product and just ensuring that, you know, we have some of the best flour out there and we can do it at volume and our manufactured goods are, are, are great. Um, if we get to that point, that will be exciting. You know, we're just not there in the evolution of, of the brands that we produce and distribute. Oh, I mentioned, I mentioned particularly for Terrace, and I'm just saying in general, just your own opinion about it. So, uh, but now that obviously that, that doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of, you know, that kind of a spend and, and the kind of money you put in behind it. And also just, you know, if you just, I guess you just got to just land on it. You've got to just almost like accidentally find yourself at a brand model that says, you know what, we could probably do something more. We could expand more on do something with this because the design, something about it will work. The wording, the messaging, whatever it could be. Now, you may mention of, Wholesale versus retail marketing strategies because Terrasen operates both retail dispensaries, including stores like the Apothecarium, and also serving wholesale clients. So <clears throat> take me through the key differences in marketing for retail versus promoting products through wholesale and the third party dispensaries that you support. We lump them together for the most part. So uh, dispensary is a dispensary. There's a little bit, there's some nuanced differences between the, the two, right? Are your own stores uh, or your third party stores? But for us, we build our programs around the sellout. So mm-hmm. we have more control, obviously, in our own stores. But the, the whole program and, and the, the thought process behind it is that whatever we come up with tactically can work at a third-party dispensary as well. So that's how we approach it. Um, we understand that 
again, we control more factors than our own stores, but our our sales team and our grassroots and brand ambassador program, like they walk into third party dispensaries with the same catalog of assets that we have at our own store. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're willing to create the visual merchandise. We're willing to come do pop-ups or whatever they call them in each specific state. So that's our approach to it. Um, because no matter where the consumer shops, we need to be able to actually execute uh, and service them for our brands. And one of the other areas I always look at is that, you know, for Terrace you support, and, and again, there's a lot of products you provide, multiple brands that you also market in the same region without creating internal competition. So expanding in the states like Maryland and Michigan, what do you do about differentiating the brands and maintaining individual strength, individual strengths? Because the fact is, you know, the, being able to go ahead and market individually these products and still getting them to get off the shelves. Yeah, so it's it's a great question, and and we um we have pretty tight brand standards as it relates to to our brands. You know, you could say there's the good, better, best model across the board, um, and that's not to say that any brand is not the best because Correct. we all think they're great. That's more around potency. That's more around size. That's more around smell. Uh, when you talk about manufactured goods, like the distillate versus a live category. So we have really tight standards around that on which SKUs go in which brand at the end of the day. Um, our our partnership with cl- with cultivation is very much like we, we work off of data. Like right. data makes all of our decisions at the end of the day. And then we give those data points to cultivation and we partner and, you know, they take the strains that we've aligned on and they do what they do, you know, at the end of the day. And, but we have tight standards around all of that because it's, it can't be a one-stop shop for all given the pricing models and discounts that we all live with day to day. Stay tuned. We have more blunt business coming up after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more blunt business. Welcome back to Blunt Business. I'm here with BJ Coretta, Senior Vice President of Marketing at TerraSend. And the website for them is T-E-R-R-A-S-C-E-N-D.com. Take a look at that as we continue. Now, when I look at the lay of what TerraSend has in terms of being a cannabis operator, vertically integrated, a lot of different diverse markets, California, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, also in Canada. And when I look at what you have here, for example, you know, you have to go and look at the different marketing strategies to resonate with local demographics. So, you know, obviously New Jersey, California, having a different feel to it in terms of what that market might serve versus, you know, it's almost like you could say it's between political boundaries or you could just say just in terms of rural versus urban. Take me through that part of the ado- the adoption process. Yeah, the last part, you nailed it. Rural, rural versus urban is like is one main cog in this wheel here because – you take a state like Michigan and you take a state like Pennsylvania, you know, Michigan is bordered by Indiana, which has no cannabis point of view at this point in time. Right. So border stores and stores in that vicinity tend to do better. It's no secret um, out there at the end of the day, Pennsylvania is, you know, still medical at this point in time, but it's, it's definitely very rural. Um, So you have to take all that into account as you look at the product mix, right? The potency levels, edibles, what makes more sense? Five, 10, 20 milligrams. It depends on the demographic that, that you're, you're looking at in each one of those markets. So we go one by one and and then you get into the pricing situation, which is always fascinating, uh, especially for a market like Michigan, where we could sell the same brand for $15 in Michigan and $40 in New Jersey, right? Just because that's where the pricing scenario is sitting for us uh, based on consumer habits. So it's, it's a puzzle. It's a, it's a little bit of a shell game, but I bet I think it's fun. I mean, it's pretty fascinating when you get data sets from California and Michigan, and then you put those up against Maryland and Pennsylvania. It's it, the evolution here is, it's still moving. It's still growing. Yeah. It's still developing. And to me, that's that makes this really fun. But now one of the things that you also have to determine with this, in terms of the market that you have, there is the data that you hopefully have and leveraging that 
so you can personalize the experience for the customers who are going to come into the specialties and go for these particular brands and find out which brand is going to be sitting best for them of the brands that your team provides. So can you tell me a little bit about what you have in terms of what consumer data and cannabis retail, what you're getting for the retail and wholesale process? Obviously, even that right there, the aspect of what you're able to go ahead and sell retail for your own end or what you're selling the third party and what they're telling you, take me inside the data that you're learning that you're able to go ahead and access to be able to determine products, localization, marketing strategy, et cetera. Yeah, we're, um, there's a, there's a bunch of different, <clears throat> excuse me, different data groups across cannabis. As everybody knows, there's BDSA, there's headset, there's et cetera, et cetera. We, we lean a lot into BDSA and then obviously we have a pretty substantial data set group internally of our own stuff from the buying perspective for our own stores. And then obviously the sell through. So we're a weekly, if not daily reviewer of that information. We, we live and breathe with it at the end of the day. Um, if something's not working, we can pivot pretty quickly. And that's always been our goal and objective. Um, you know, there's, there's strain fatigue in certain markets, right? Where you just keep pumping the same strain over and over and buy some buyers want newness. They want to be able to promote the newness, things like that. So we're we're in constant dialogue with our partners. We're in constant evaluation of the data sets. Um, everything, every decision we make product-wise, data is a massive, massive part on that. Uh, so it's, it's, I have a data team, we have a data team internally and, you know, we crunch a lot of numbers and we just, there's no reason to make something that we know we can't move. Right. Well, that's the part of also determining retail versus wholesale. So the information you get from the third party companies, because in a wholesale process, just almost like a Costco model, you want whatever your product you're getting out there, it's in bulk. You're, you're pushing it out there. You want to make sure it gets out there, it gets sold. And it's like you were clearing out whatever you can get out of there. So when you look at that determination, I mean, how much does that determine what you do with the retail side of it in terms of what products you're going to do best and how much to produce? I, I think it's the sole, or not the sole, it's the lead determining factor on it. Um, I sat on a panel at Benzinga last year and out here in LA. Yeah. One of the things we talked about was, I don't view the sell-in as exceptionally difficult. The sell-out is hard. Right. And if you can't sell out, and I'm a store owner, I'm not putting you back on my shelf. Like, I don't care how cool you think your brand is. Yeah. If your product's not moving and me as the store owner is responsible for, uh-oh, now I got to drop it 30, 40%. I'm going to go back to the brand owner and say, you need to give me credits here because I can't move what you sold me. And that then hurts the future, right, of that relationship. So for us, it's 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 very much a two-way conversation of here's what here's what we think we can move with you at what price let's work together on it and then here's how we'll support it like i'll send we'll send street team members over we'll send swag or accessory or giveaways or we'll run a contest like whatever they need because if you can't do the sell out then they're not going to put you back on the shelf right now one of the things i know that when it comes to digital marketing and we know there's still limitations on what can be done and what's being allowed. Uh, X has been much more receptive and more responsive now to digital marketing efforts. And that's one of the areas you obviously are very adept in when it comes to working with, you know, Embassy Universal, Fender, and all those various entities within. So the digital innovation you can do into cannabis marketing now and what you're available to what can you about the technology or platforms right now that have been most effective in building brand loyalty that you've been able to go ahead and you been able to leverage and utilize these days that works best? It's a great question. And I think it's one of those things that hasn't evolved where it should have, it, it yeah. should be at this point in time in the cannabis uh, uh, growth over the last, whatever, eight to 10 years. Yeah. Email is still our tried and true. And the reason is, is because of that's end-to-end -end communication that we control. Mm -hmm. And we have really tight strategy and program around getting people signed up in the ingress and the egress of stores when they come in and out, uh, landing pages, pop-ups, et cetera. We're driving e email, email signups a lot. Um, our e-com 
conversion percentage has substantially grown um, in the Northeast, specifically Michigan starting to inch up a little bit more and more, which is great, which is a big focus. And then we just recently launched our all of our apps. Um, they've been launched, but we kind of re- revised them. And we've got a really hardcore focus because, again, it's another end-to-end program that we can control at the end of the day, as opposed to even with Twitter, with X, sorry, which is great. It's expensive. It's very expensive. And when, oh. you, look at the, when you look at the ROI on it, don't really know that it makes a ton of sense unless you're looking at huge budgets um, at the end of the day. So we're really focused on one, how much we can control end to end communication of the consumer. And then two, what is the ROI on it? Because if it, if the ROI is not, you know, I don't want to say one to one because that's crazy, but if it's not close, then, you know, we will take a step back at the end of the day. That's it. for us. It's all about if someone wants to wants to hand me something and say we will drive conversion and sales to you, and they will prove it for free, and they do it, I'll spend money. Like we'll 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 invest in it because uh, that's all we're trying to do is get people in, and then let the sales team or the dot com or uh, the product speak for themselves. And it's too bad that there's not more leverage you're going to be able to do because I'll tell you one of the things, and this is my own personal experience, is that. You know, if I'm looking on social media, or if I'm just looking on, like, say, you know, if you have a social media in general, whether either YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, I can't see how many times I've been lured in by somebody that's been so micro targeted to what I would be interested in. Obviously, you know, there's something that's going on where my data is being put out there and people are able to go and find through my search industry what I'm looking for. And oh, goodness gracious, here comes something I want to go and look for. Oh, look, shoes, this and that. And I'll find whatever. And it's going to get me even, I mean, they're getting much more. It's kind of deceptive, but it's also very much more creative in targeting advertising because yeah. that's more of what's happening to, to me when I look at it every day is that the targeting now is so micro targeted, just almost at a sole consumer based on what you can find out of the history of what they're interested in. And at this point, what is there available that you could do in terms of for the cannabis industry? I'll be able to go ahead and targeting the consumers that are out there. Obviously, you have those where you could go through email and other areas that they're at least going to respond back. You're going to get something where they're going to opt in for something. But what about for those that, you know, is there anything that is available at your arsenal to go ahead and micro-target consumers to lure them to your pro- to the products or to the stores? There's a little bit of it. There's We have a pretty substantial SEO program that we work on, uh, which, you know, that's a marathon. That's Oh, yeah. That's that takes a long time, a lot of writing. AdWords, we've we've cracked the code on that, and we do that pretty well. Um, you know, there's the other ecosystems of the cannabis specific of the weed maps and Leafly, and you know, I think most people come in and out of those based on results. At the end of the day, um, I wish there was more. I mean, if you go back to my Fender days. You know, I right. jump on, jump up and down on a chair every single day because I could literally the team could go on Meta and search every artist known to man or put put them into the to the system, and I could service an ad to them for our new guitar, and they didn't even realize why, and it was because they mentioned Eric Clapton over the last thirty days on something, so. I wish we had that. Um, we're just not there. Hopefully, we can get there over time. I think, I think most companies, tech companies, just overthink it. At the end of the day, um, but no, I want to ask you about this too because in terms of the advertising and what's made available, one of the areas I never really looked at, but I, you know, on Blum Business Grassroots Marketing, we always talk about the fact of the DEA rescheduling and the importance of what that's going to be once the DEA decides to go and make the finalization and everything's put in the stone that cannabis is rescheduled from schedule one to schedule three. Now in terms of U S statute or U S code, eight forty three twenty one USC, eight forty three still legal to place advertisements in publications like newspapers or magazines. If the purpose is to illegally receive buy or distribute schedule one control substances and that, if cannabis were reclassified, those penalties would no longer apply, that there's less stringent controls and which are deemed to have no accepted medical use or high potential for abuse. So 
the cannabis industry would be far more nuanced. I'm taking from a story from Cannabis Business Times. Now, does the DA rescheduling could we, that we keep talking about, do you know of or do you feel like that would be anything to, that would offer some opening up? Like I said, if it's a Schedule Three drug, is there more room open to advertise or are there other avenues that open up because of it? I would hope so. But then you also, it, it, well, let me back up. In theory, yes, it should. But then you also have to deal with the individuals who either own those companies or if they're publicly traded or if they wake up on what side of the bed. Because do they want to allow cannabis to be advertised on their platform? Uh, I don't know. I, I think we still are dealing with there's still a separation of of individuals who still look at it as something not great. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it would probably have to go publication or outlet or medium by medium. I do think I do firmly believe though, when that happens, I think we're gonna still need to do a substantial amount of education around all of it. Absolutely. Uh, it to not only the owners of of the mediums, but just to consumers uh, at the end of the day, because I we we still haven't cracked that that yet, and I hope the 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 scheduling update will help that because there's a lot to talk about. There's so many benefits of this plant, and we see it in our data, but we don't have the platforms to really talk that much widely about it. And I and I think right. that'll help bring more people in um, to experience it at the end of the day. Let's kind of segue into what TerraSense is now providing in terms of products. One of the areas that's been a, a focus right now for TerraSense is Kind Tree. So the product is uh, dedicated to producing sexual cannabis with respect for the earth and love for one pl- for the plant. So you have flour, tinctures, concentrates, cartridges, vape dabl- vapes, dabligators, and distillate syringes. So tell me about the Kind Tree product and what's that's coming across and, and the message that's coming across with that. Yeah, Kindry has done really well for us over the last year and a half. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're fortunate to be partnered with Cookies and, you know, their genetics yeah. everybody knows about and and they make really great products and been a great partner. Kindry's been our workhorse. It's been the the middle of the road everyday consumer and I think the number one benefit that we have with that brand is that and I we try to explain this to people as much as we can in the simplest way in in stores and in third party dispensaries, but it's grown by the same cultivation team that grows cookies. So the same guys, Jeremy Cohen and his crew, they grow kind tree strains and they produce it. And they're the ones doing cookies. So it's coming out of the same garden. Wow. There we go. And we can't tell people that enough um, because the kind, the kind tree consumers, I wouldn't say they're, they're a mixture. It's like that super mixture of, core but also new right because it's it's right there in the area of it's it's not gonna it's not gonna give you this crazy first or second experience it's mm-hmm. consistent and it, it's it's consistent across the board and that's because of those that team at the end of the day and you know we're the we're the beneficiaries of of that stay tuned we have more blunt business coming up after a short break Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back to Blunt Business, powered by the Buzz CRM, which is the makers of a comprehensive marketing suite with over 500 marketing tools in one platform, AI power marketing automation, omni-channel communication, conversational AI, smart workflows and customization, advanced analytics and reporting, all in one, thebuzzcrm.com. Get your free trial today, thebuzzcrm.com. And once again, I'm joined by the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Terrison here on Blue Business, BJ Coretta. What other area I want to also talk about? We mentioned Canada also in terms of what product lines that you have out there. Um, is there any difference where you're at right now in terms of what possibilities could you, I mean, with the federal legalization in Canada versus here? Are there any things that you wish you could adopt here in the U.S. with the marketing strategy that you can do in Canada? Not really. I mean, our part, our Canada for us is cookies up there. Um, so, you know, they're cookie stores, it's product, it's, it's everything. Um, I, I'm not overly familiar with how the intricacies of that work. Cause it is so handled at the end of the day, um, by the federal government up there. So yeah. not, not much of a takeaway from our perspective. It just across the board, nobody wants to go and give it any kind of a chance. It's like, it just, 
so many hurdles and so many obstacles to go through. But, you know, nevertheless, what you're able to going to do in terms of Terrasen and what they're, they're going to do in terms of products, it's also a lot of lines I want to make mention of that are, are really wonderful that you have that you have under your umbrella. There's Legend, there's Valhalla. Wana brands we're very big fans of. State Flower, Alaria Healthcare, uh, among others. And with that said, let's go ahead and also make mention of that for those who are stock aficionados, that's always talk about. You can also find Terrasen on the OTCQX under the ticker symbol TSNDF and on the TSX Toronto Stock Exchange. Or, yeah, uh, or TSND, so you want to go look for that as well. And finally, you know, take a minute to tell me about Terrasen for those that want to go and work with you. And, you know, if they are looking to go and find the great line of products that Terrasen represents, you know, other potential wholesale, wholesalers that want to go and work with you and other retail opportunities, what should they do? Yeah, I mean, if you're in... If you're in the Northeast, obviously it's all the apothecary partners. Um, you can go to our website or just reach out to them direct. Michigan, we have two, actually four different retail brands in Michigan. Gage is is the big one with with multiple, multiple locations in Michigan. Just look for the orange. And then obviously we operate cookie stores in Michigan. We have one lemonade. And then our border stores, what we call them, are the pinnacles. So that all runs through gagecannabis.com. Um, so any any interest there, just reach out to them. But we got a lot going on. So it's uh, every day is something different and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, there, there's quite a few names we actually had when it came to Gage, Juana, uh, State Flower, and Alira. I know we've had them here on the program as well. It's wonderful. And what we say is terrasend.com, T-E-R-R-A-S-C-E-N-D.com. One more time, T E R R A S. CEND.com. And again, here with BJ Coretta, Senior Vice President of Marketing at Terrasen. Thank you for being on with us. Really appreciate you taking time out. This is great, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, be well. And we'll talk again in the future. Absolutely. And thank you, listeners. We'll talk to you next time. Are you tired of juggling contacts, manually following up, and deals falling to the cracks? We can fix it so you never lose another lead, enabling 24-7 sales and support via an AI that learns your business. Ready to close more deals with less hassle? Get a free trial of our marketing automation at thebuzzcrm.com.